So in uh, studying the embryo, or studying organogenesis in mouse embryos, this is just an aside before I start. Um, able to uh, follow organogenesis in the mouse uh, live because um, you can only keep mouse embryos alive outside of the mother for about, you know, anywhere, somewhere between 8 and 12 hours. At really critical times when you want to find out about the basic mechanisms of, say, uh, organogenesis in the kidney, in the heart, or the liver, or any of the multitude of other other major organs in the body, um, you have a very narrow window in which you can remove uh, those tissues from the embryo and actually study them live. Okay, so uh, the embryoid bodies provide an opportunity and access to both the chemical environment of those forming organs as well as the mechanical environment of those forming organs. And so as an exploratory vehicle, I think they're, they're tremendous. As an engineering vehicle, I think they're also going to be uh, remarkably powerful. They may not be the technology that we use ultimately, but they will be a test bed uh, that engineers can take and practice uh, and, and test their hypotheses on. All right. So uh, how is it that the embryo is actually uh, grown? And I think the, the basic idea that I think of how embryos are built is that first uh, you assemble the basic structure of the, like, like building a house. Uh, you frame, you, you build the foundation, uh, you frame the walls, uh, you put up the roof. And that's the very basic movements of early embryogenesis. Uh, somewhat later, you call in the electrician, the plumber, uh, the cable guy, uh, you call in the phone company, and they string up all the sort of secondary things, all the, all the organs that actually make the house uh, habitable. Now, the difference between you building a house and the embryo building something like a house is that you would order all the parts at full size. Uh, in the embryo, the house is built about yay big, right, with all of the plumbing, everything else, and then you, in, you grow it up to the size of your, you know, your three-story house. So there's a tremendous amount of growth that takes place with the, in the presence of functioning organs. Okay? And I think that's, that's sort of the remarkable thing about uh, this, this um, transition from an early embryo until later stages where you have a functioning, a physiologically functioning organism. Okay. So um, what I'm going to tell you about today is all about this early embryogenesis um, and the mechanics that, that follow. And so I'm, I'm really fortunate to have followed Ray Keller's uh, uh, lectures. And so I can, I can bask in the, in the idea that you already understand a, a fair bit of early uh, embryogenesis. And what I'm going to tell you about is some work uh, that we and others are doing to try to measure uh, the stiffness and force uh, operating within the early embryos and how uh, these processes may be regulated on a mechanical scale. So I'm going to show you a few time-lapse movies and you probably have seen many more about how individual programs, sort of subroutines of uh, cell migration, directed cell migration, uh, branching morphogenesis actually build structure. So the first of these is the generation of what's called the lateral line in zebrafish. The lateral line is a, is a uh, sensory package that's distributed down the, the body of the zebrafish embryo and exists in the adult zebrafish. And it's a way for the embryo and the adult fish to recognize the presence of predators and thus escape from predators. So um, this is a, a key uh, sensory system in the zebrafish. What happens and how it's built is almost as if you would lay out, you would build a sensory system around, a protective sensory system around your house. Uh, you would start at the brain with a package of cells and then you would string those cells out in a line from the brain to the tail and at regular intervals this sort of string uh, of connectivity uh, drops sensory packages. And those sensory packages are seen here as these little nodules. Now the, progr the program of which this works involves a directed migration of an epithelial cell type moving through a densely packed uh, field of cells. 
So this is not like uh, you're, you're growing this in any way. It's actually moving. And at in the regular intervals, uh, it decide, this uh, slug here sort of kicks out, kicks out a package of uh, sensory cells. Okay? Uh, this takes about eight hours. And if you look very closely, you can see how these individual cells are, are organized in their migratory pattern. Now, this migratory pattern depends on uh, feedback systems of signaling between uh, the substrate, uh, the leading edge cells, the rest of the cells in the package, and then the, the cells in the sensory system that's being sort of uh, produced as needed and kicked off the back of this migrating slug. You have another system of uh, br what, what's called branching morphogenesis. This is an example from uh, the, the Constantinian lab showing the the growth of a uh, branch network within an embryonic kidney. So you can barely see the outlines of the mesenchymal cells here. All that's labeled with GFP is the embryonic epithelium of the kidney. But you can see how there, each of these uh, branches is formed, how the sort of iterative process of, of branching morphogenesis works, or at least how, uh, how it proceeds. With, uh, in our work, we're very interested in um, how the cellular mechanisms, like say at this scale, operate to drive uh, the, the process of gastrulation at this scale. Sort of bridging the scale of multicellular processes like uh, actin contractility to the level of uh, many thousands and thousands of cells that drive uh, the sort of dramatic shape changes uh, that I, th I think Ray Keller was telling you about. Okay, so for this work, I think, uh, so my appointment is, my primary appointment is as a bioengineer, but I have a secondary appointment and a, a longstanding uh, commitment to the field of developmental biology. And so I like to contrast uh, how tissue engineers and developmental biologists are different, but also what kind of things they share, they might share in common. So I think there's a, there's a commonality to these two fields. So tissue engineers are interested in forward engineering, uh, translational research, uh, you know, basically trying to apply fundamental laws to build artificial structures and ultimately to produce useful devices. Um, developmental biologists are not nearly so practical as that, right? So uh, primarily they love to do sort of reverse engineering, puzzling out the pathways and the, the networks that drive early development. It's very basic research, but they're figuring out fundamental laws like uh, these fundamental laws of gene function, the establishment of pattern in the early embryo, and how uh, in this particular case, in my particular case, how uh, structures are elaborated during morphogenesis. Now this common region here I think is particularly interesting. Um, so there are many shared interests and the first of, you know, there's many shared interests between bioengineers and, uh, and, and uh, developmental biologists, very practical ones like uh, bioimaging and how to quantitate cell and molecular biology features how to be very quantitative about these things. But I think we also share interests in the ability to reverse and forward engineer uh, tissues and organs. And I think our goals, and, I, and Todd, I think, shares the same, same interests, is to understand how to turn uh, modules of development into a new technology. So when we think about the major advances in engineering, we think about uh, how electrical engineers build, uh, build circuits today. They don't start with a random array of components, pick randomly out of the box, put them together into a circuit, and then uh, build maybe 10,000 circuits and only keep the ones that work. Instead, they have simulation tools that, where they really understand how each of those components work, and they simulate that structure before they actually go and build it. We don't have that as tissue engineers, and I think uh, the future really requires those kinds of uh, both the simulation tools, but also the fundamental understanding of the, what are the different components? What do these very basic modules do? Okay. And so I think we can start to think, and I'm, this is going to be sort of my last uh, grand theme slide, um, but I think we can start to understand, uh, take this principle of uh, 
control theory and begin to understand how it works on the scale of development. So at the level of genes, uh, controlling protein expression, which then controls cell behaviors, which produce, if in open loop kind of configuration, uh, morphogenetic movements. But if those movements go wrong, or if they're somehow outside of the normal parameters of, uh, of, of a healthy developing embryo, there might be um, these control circuits. So there have to be ways in which uh, the measured, uh, which the output is measured and compared to some sort of uh, input. And so this, uh, this circuit is actually, uh, I think it's a, sort of a crazy way, to, maybe a crazy way to think about development because we have no idea how output is compared to desired inputs, but I think it's a start to, to begin to think about these problems. Okay, so what I'm gonna be focusing on here is the mechanics of development, uh, the first lecture on mechanics of development, and I'm gonna be focusing on very early uh, movements, sort of <laughs> basically uh, building the, the foundation, the walls, and the roof of the embryo, setting up the what's called the basic body plan, okay? So, and the question is, what is morphogenesis? And I think it's the, both the cellular and the mechanical process that shape tissues and organs. Um, and then how is this process studied? So typically, and I think the first, uh, the first part here is really encompasses all of developmental biology. So the idea is to manipulate and assess events within complex multicellular tissues, either through uh, molecular perturbations, chemical perturbations, uh, now we're using uh, physical or even optical perturbations. Now we're doing some approach, we're taking some approaches to measure the mechanical prop processes and properties in these embryonic tissues. I think there's maybe, a, there's a few groups around the world studying uh, these processes in vertebrates. A fair number of groups are studying them in, uh, in Drosophila, for instance. But I think I can demonstrate today that uh, the model system that we're working with and perhaps the embryoid bodies provide uh, significantly greater access to controlling some of these uh, physical mechanical properties. And then there are systems approaches using computer simulation and synthetic biology uh, to try to directly control morphogenesis in a in sort of a forward thinking way. Okay, so why would we study? So first of all, uh, this is sort of the part on your grant proposal um, that's I think critically important. Um, to understand the basic science of morphogenesis is really gonna help us understand uh, the origins of birth defects and uh, the environmental risk factors, the genotypic risk factors of birth defects and perhaps su suggest methods of prevention. Another aspect of morphogenesis is uh, the problem of dysmorphogenesis during wound healing and also during you know, very chronic diseases such as cancer. Uh, the dysmorphogenesis is really a poorly understood uh, feature of these diseases, but is often a critical contributor to the lethality of those diseases. Okay, and then lastly, I think this is where, uh, uh, you know, why I'm here now is that I think tissue engineers need to understand uh, these rules and principles of morphogenesis uh, in order to design novel tissues and materials for tissue regeneration. Okay, so we envision that there, there are really three roles for mechanics during embryogenesis. And we can think of them in the context of this sort of network diagram. As I came from physics originally and uh, went into developmental biology fairly late in life, but I've come to love these sort of network, you know, sort of gene arrow gene network models. Um, so I think you can, you can begin to think about uh, information at this level. Uh, operating within multicellular tissues. You have, especially in the embryo, you have information provided maternally that's stored in the egg. It's carried from the egg all the way through early development. Uh, these factors and cues in the early egg contribute to uh, patterning and the level of gene regulatory networks that control uh, specifics of uh, what genes are expressed in what tissues, and then you have growth factor signaling which reiterates and feeds back to these gene regulatory networks. Now, uh, cell identity is nothing if not uh, to set up the morphogenetic program within those cells. So the key point of creating these patterns of different cell identities is to 
turn on the expression of morphogenetically active proteins, things that control uh, the cytoskeleton, uh, control the adhesion, control extracellular matrix, levels of uh, factors like rho GTPases that can control contractility and stiffness. Uh, and then these, uh, when cells have these different arrays or uh, sets of proteins expressed, they engage in different cell behaviors. These are macroscopic uh, properties of cells, uh, and whereas these are just sort of molecular uh, expression profiles. Okay, so once the cell behaviors are are initiated and triggered, um, these cells can then are capable of generating force, and are gener are capable of establishing the mechanical uh, resistance or stiffness of a particular tissue, and then. Once you have these uh, features established, you can then drive the directly um, the shaping of tissues. Okay, so I think developmental biologists have been focusing on uh, this particular role of uh, mechanics and development for mm, probably by now about 125 years. Okay, now these other two these other two roles are really recent inventions. Uh, the idea that uh, developmental uh, programs must be robust in a way to accommodate changes in the microenvironment or changes in the variation in, say, maternal contributions and the, the operation of signal transduction networks. This now is thought to operate where uh, bulk forces and stiffness might uh, have some sort of crosstalk to one another and may also operate on the level of these proteins uh, directly where one uh, multi-protein component could talk to another one within the cell and uh, adjust the properties of these structures like focal adhesions uh, quite locally. And then lastly, I think uh, tissue engineers and, and stem cell biology has been uh, suggesting now that there are cues uh, to guide cell fate uh, embedded within the mechanical properties of the early developing embryo and that these feed back not just to sort of cell behaviors, which we, we can see sometimes, but feed all the way back up to this uh, really fundamental level of information, controlling and changing gene regulatory networks. Now we've known that there are cues provided from uh, tissue movement for a long time. Uh, developmental biologists know about the, the, if you've heard of the term induction, and that in term induction means that a tissue that has moved out of one microenvironment into a new microenvironment can now signal um, to create a, a third uh, type tissue type. Um, this, this function of uh, cell fate decision has been known about for a long time, but I think the ones where it de depends critically on just the local microenvironment uh, is relatively new. So we like to think about the embryo as a machine. Um, and you know, I'm going to have uh, this equation is my major equation. So there's a, there may be one more complicated one later on. And I think you've, you've had a, a lecture where you talk about stress and strain. This is essentially uh, strain on the left-hand side. Uh, strain is dependent on the amount of force uh, applied to a material. And its effectiveness, the effectiveness of that force is determined by the mechanical resistance. So something that's stiff, if you push on it, it deforms very little. Something that's soft, you push on it, it deforms a lot. And so when we think about this equation, we can think about how it relates to uh, the movements in the early embryo. So on the left-hand side, this is typically deformation. This is what we watch when we, uh, when we follow embryonic development. Um, we can be very quantitative about it or we can be very qualitative about it. Uh, we watch how these tissues change shape. Uh, we watch how they move and the rates of those movements. Uh, and the more sophisticated people are now beginning to measure uh, more engineering terms. And they're describing engineering terms like strain and flow. So we're beginning to move into a more uh, quantitative uh, 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 world. Um, but with all of these aspects, we don't need to perturb embryos. All we have to do is set up a movie, uh, watch them. We can use fluorescence. We can use uh, you know, just a, a visible light. Um, but you don't need to perturb embryos just for this, just to measure deformation. 
However, if we want information about the force and the mechanical resistance, we actually have to go in to these embryonic tissues and actually perturb them. We have to pull a piece of tissue out to measure bulk forces or bulk elasticity. Uh, we have to poke at them to see if they can, uh, how they respond uh, both mechanically and through signaling to these applied forces. So um, I think that you know, in order to make these kind of measurements, we cannot make these measurements uh, in the absence of perturbation just by uh, watching. You can't look at the gene expression profile and say, that this tissue now has a stiffness of 1.5 kilopascal. Uh, we currently don't have that ability. Okay, so in trying to think about, uh, thinking about the embryo as a machine, we really want to understand how it works and then why it breaks. So here's an example of two embryos. On the left-hand side is an embryo that's developing normally uh, from the process of just having finished gastrulation. And on the right-hand side of this is an embryo that's overexpressing uh, a member of the planar cell polarity pathway, strabismus. Okay, so uh, what you see on the left-hand side is the beautiful elongation of the embryo, the tail of the embryo, the head of the embryo are separating from one another. You have the rising of the folds, uh, which enclose the central nervous system. Okay, so at the end of this movie, which is a, uh, a few hours after the start, uh, you have eye, uh, eyes forming and you have the tail. In this uh, mutant embryo, this embryo is very defective. The head is right here, and instead of the tail moving further away, the tail is right next to the head. Um, so I don't know if Ray expressed, uh, described this particular kind of mutant before, but um, I like to think about it as uh, a head uh, aggregated to a butt, and you could call this a butt head mutation. All right. So uh, this is a really uh, a lethal flaw in the development of the embryo, and uh, we're particularly interested in just really what goes wrong under these conditions. Okay. So we come back to this, uh, this, uh, this basic equation. And so in order to study this further, I think that as engineers, we need to develop uh, imaging tools to detect cell and tissue scale structures. Uh, we have to d build and design uh, structures, devices to control the microenvironment. And some of these are going to be mechanical. Some of these are microfluidic. Um, I am, a, a, I would say, a, a, I'm interested in the, in the question, and I'm eager to work with people to build whatever kind of tools and devices that we need to make these kind of measurements. And so that's led us into a number of different collaborations, and I'm, I'm really proud of being able to work with uh, people who are more engineering focused than we are um, on that. And then finally, there's a, there's a major problem coming up on the horizon, and that is with uh, the high density imaging information that we're gathering. Uh, single experiments can collect a terabyte of imaging data. How do you go about analyzing that? Well, you could start with maybe uh, 100,000 undergraduates uh, working away, uh, clicking and hand digitizing. But I think that's, you're going to quickly run out of undergraduates that way. Um, so I, there, there are data processing tools that are being developed to, that will help us understand these. Okay. All right, so the focus of the rest of the talk is on uh, the process of gastrulation. And Ray maybe told you that uh, the blastula develops into the tadpole. And this is essentially a transformation uh, from a ball of cells into a hollow tube of cells. This is a topological transformation first into something that looks uh, from a ball of cells into something that maybe looks more like a bagel. And then once you have the bagel form, the bagel elongates into a nice long uh, uh, sort of pasta-like shape, like a penne, right? So you have this early uh, development, which involves large-scale movements of uh, endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm, and places those tissues into their proper location. This stage is something that you can think about as your house. Uh, that's framed, it has the roof, it has uh, all the basic structure, but it doesn't have any of the organs yet. There's relatively few neurons, there's no functioning gut, there's no organs branching off the gut. Uh, this is a, a sort of a, a, a blank tablet for the establishment of organs and limbs and everything else. 
Okay, so our model system that we're focusing on uh, is the Xenopus embryo, and uh, this is the process of gastrulation and neurulation that I was just showing you. But the frog embryo has tremendous advantages to my group as, uh, as engineers, because we can take embryos out of the, they're, they're fertilized in, in vitro, so we don't have to worry about uh, uh, culture conditions very much. Um, they're relatively large in size. Development is fast compared to mouse, which takes days to gastrulate, or even in embryoid bodies, it takes days to, to reach that stage. Um, these reach that stage in less than 24 hours. And in the process of from 24 to about uh, 34 hours, they've completed the basic construction of the house. They've moved all their tissues inside. Uh, there are very simple culture conditions. We culture embryos on the bench top at room temperature in, in defined salt solutions. So as uh, engineers who always have, seem to have problems keeping their cells alive or working with sterile technique, these guys are so easy to work with. So uh, s cheap and fast, I'd have to say. Okay, so the, there's good news and bad news about studying early development. The, the bad news is that Xenopus gastrulation is deceptively simple. You can watch these movies and get a sense of what's going on, the folding, the deformation. However, um, they're accompanied by a series of complex uh, internal movements. Sort of in this region, there are a whole slew of internal movements uh, within the embryo and that involve multiple cell types, both mesenchymal cells and epithelial cells. The good news is that there's been a uh, hundred years of experimental embryology where each one of these particular proper processes can be uh, tested in a specific tissue explant. So you can cut the embryo apart and test each one of these phenomena within an isolated tissue fragment. Okay, so. Um, that's the good news, and that's the result of the, what's called the cut and paste uh, embryology of, the, the, of amphibian embryos. Okay, and one such example of cut and paste is, uh, is used to understand the process of convergence and extension. So Ray told you all about that, I'm sure. Um, just to sort of highlight this again, if you cut and paste a piece of tissue and take it out of the embryo, all of the processes that are operating within the embryo are recapitulated in these uh, tissue isolates. So just I think like the processes operating within embryo body as you, uh, you can dissect it further, uh, operate autonomously within this tissue. And so by watching this, we can see that this tissue self-assembles and autonomously deforms at a, at a strain rate of about 10 to 20% per hour. And this is where the speed aspect comes into play. Um, I won't cover this too much, but just to say that uh, this process is driven by uh, convergent extension where uh, a, a group of cells, so, so say maybe uh, two by two cells, undergo a process of uh, directed cell intercalation which drives the elongation of this uh, array of cells so that the sort of head cell here is pushed away from the butt cell uh, at the posterior end of this this array. So we come back to this equation again and want to understand what the mechanical context is that allows these cells to intercalate between one another to push the head away from the butt. And so we, the first thing we wanted to do was understand what the mechanical resistance of this array of cells were, was to uh, any applied force. And so we started uh, in my group uh, adopting a, a device that was first developed in Ray's group by Steve Moore and Mimi Cole um, called the Histo Wiggler. Now you really can't uh, go about talking about the Histo Wiggler in public too much. Uh, it affects your credibility somewhat. So of course as uh, proper engineers uh, we created a, a three-letter acronym, the Nano Newton Force Measurement Device or a four-letter acronym. Uh, this is a, a device that allows us to apply an unconstrained uniaxial compression test. Uh, the way that this works is that we put a piece of tissue on this apparatus and uh, this is this one of these pieces of tissue where the it's that's been excised from the embryo. Say the head it would be at this end and the tail end would be at this end except we've we've cut them off uh, and then we can compress them between
plates. We can measure the force of resistance of this block of tissue, uh, the amount of uh, strain that's being applied, uh, the cross-sectional area uh, over time, and then we can calculate from that uh, all the mechanical parameters that are uh, describe the behavior of a standard linear solid material. So uh, we can look at this piece of tissue and pull out parameters of, uh, of elasticity and its viscous behavior. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all of the experiments that we've done, but just sort of try to summarize the conclusions of this basic uh, descriptive work. So the first thing that we discovered was that, of course, you know, if you look at this uh, elastic response, you realize that tissues are neither liquid nor solid, but really viscoelastic. The surprising thing to us was that when we look at how much strain that goes on, how much deformation occurs over this short period of time, very little of that strain is stored in the embryo permanently. So at any time, the embryo has about uh, 5 to 10 percent strain that it's storing. And that's about 20 to 30 minutes of deformation. After that, that's, those strain energies are dissipated by the viscous nature. Okay. One other surprising thing that we found was that uh, dorsal tissues, these tissues stiffen dramatically over eight hours. So in that time course of the movie that I was showing you, the embryo stiffens uh, sixfold. So it's like you woke up this morning and you weighed 100 pounds. You're great. You wake up, you go run six miles, you come back. Uh, but throughout the day, you're getting stiffer and stiffer and stiffer. And by the end of the day, you weigh 600 pounds. And I would dare you to go out and try to run another six miles. Um, th but the embryo seems to do this without effort. The rates of elongation, the rates of tissue movement and deformation are linear throughout this whole time course. In watching that movie, you didn't see things sort of slow down as the process proceeds. Now, that the tissue stiffnesses that we're talking about here, though, are ultra low. If you think, look at the, the actual units here, uh, the embryos start off at less than 20 pascal. And when I say they stiffen over time, they're going up to maybe 100 pascal in stiffness. These are ultra soft tissues. Okay, and to compare them to the mechanical properties of adult tissues, you see very quickly that there are very few adult tissues that are down in the level of stiffness of these early embryonic tissues. But I think stem cells are, are one of the places where you see a very similar transition from early soft to later stiff. Now, this is, this, these measurements are not extendable to every type of embryo. Uh, in fact, as a grad student, I measured the mechanical properties of sea urchin embryos at the same stage, and they're in the kilopascal range. So um, this is not an extendable. I think we have to understand uh, each embryo in the context. If we're going to do comparative embryology, we have to go and measure mechanics in those uh, embryos. As, uh, as we're doing more experiments, my grad student uh, who is doing this took on a, a heroic series of microsurgical uh, manipulations where we could cut various pieces of that tissue out, uh, make new explants that are really impossible to make genetically, and test the mechanical properties of those. And so he made a series of very complex uh, explants, and, but found ultimately that there's a remarkable uh, variation or diversity in mechanical microenvironments at the same stage. So uh, endoderm tissues here, and shown in yellow, uh, are very, very soft. They're much lower in stiffness than the bulk tissue. Um, the mesoderm here, the cells that are undergoing uh, convergence and extension, are actually nine times stiffer uh, than uh, those endoderm cells. And, a, and lastly, I think one thing that we didn't realize or really sort of fail to realize on a regular basis is that there's tremendous amount of embryo to embryo variation in stiffness and even force production. We see a twofold variation between uh, siblings. So you can look at a dish at 100 embryos and expect to see somewhere in that dish, uh, invisible to you at the moment, that some of them are uh, very soft and some of them are twice as stiff as those, uh, as those other em embryos. And yet they all develop at uh, the same rate and they develop uh, and reach maturity. Yes? How about the ratio of the 
So we haven't been able to do that. So these, these, hero these set of microsurgical manipulations uh, do show quite a bit of variability uh, in the stiffness of those, those tissues. But there's very, a lot of variability in uh, these microsurgical manipulations. And I'd say, I could jump to say, yes, we see, we see variation. We do see variation, but I'm not sure that that can't be attributed to uh, the microsurgical manipulation. So once you start cutting into an embryo, uh, things become a lot more difficult to, 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 you know, that sort of question is hard to answer. Okay, so uh, as, a, as a cell and developmental biologist, um, I start to, we started to ask the question of how stiffness was controlled molecularly. And we could have gone and done a microarray and come up with the top uh, 25 candidates, uh, but instead we took, down a pe took out a piece of paper and just wrote down uh, some of our favorite morphogenetically active uh, proteins. And so uh, top on the list was a set of extracellular matrix proteins that are expressed within the embryo at these early stages uh, that increase in expression over, over time. And then we uh, listed uh, elements of the cytoskeleton, uh, actomyosin and microtubules as critical candidates. And we have also all sorts of other things that we've not yet, uh, we've not yet tested directly. Um, but just to uh, give you a jump on this, we were able to rule out uh, the role of the extracellular matrix. We could knock down uh, extracellular matrix synthesis make measurements of stiffness, found absolutely no change in the stiffness. This was most disappointing to me because uh, I'd done a whole lot of work as a postdoc on uh, fibronectin synthesis, fibronectin scaffold assembly, uh, handling and ma manipulation of extracellular matrix. But you know, you wake up the next morning and you say, okay, let's just keep going. It's good to know. I mean, I think uh, this is a remarkable, but it's not too unexpected because the embryo doesn't really start to express very uh, stiff extracellular matrices like collagen until several uh, hours after these measurements were made. Uh, what it, we found instead was that actomyosin was the critical contributor of uh, tissue stiffness in these systems. Even uh, microtubules, we could uh, knock down microtubules and uh, surprisingly we found when we knocked down microtubules, we found the embryo stiffened. Uh, but that was due to a rather uh, totally a biological issue uh, in that there are uh, activators of rho GTPase that are bound to microtubules. And when you depolymerize microtubules, you free these, uh, these actomyosin activating proteins. And once we excluded those proteins from, uh, from the embryo, we found that there was absolutely no change in stiffness when we knocked out microtubules. Okay, so. Um, so we have this set of questions where we now understand what the subcellular uh, 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 proteins that are responsible for mechanics, and we understand their effect on the bulk force mechanics. So uh, we realize that subcellular actomyosin dynamics are effectors. Um, we can now show that we can do, we can actually do experimental biomechanics on these tissues, even though they're very, very small. Um, and that we can describe uh, the, the material properties of these tissues uh, quantitatively. Okay. So we wanted to start asking uh, more fundamental questions about how these tissues uh, changed with time and how programs of feedback were actually operating. And so uh, what kind of mechanosensing and feedback might there be? So we have this uh, a sort of top-down array and we started to think about how sensing might operate. So on one scale, um, the very, very fast scale where there might be multi-protein complexes such as myosin or uh, uh, complexes within the focal adhesions operating. Um, the ones that were particularly interesting to us were these sort of moderate scale uh, feedback mechanisms. All of these are cell autonomous. And so when a cell feels a mechanically, a mechanically stiff environment, it can compensate. But how does a tissue uh, do that? How does a one cell over here compensate for uh, mechanical events that might be happening 10 or 100 cells away, which we see in the, in the real embryo? Uh, we also see uh, slow scale events, maybe operating on the uh, life, of the life cycle of the embryo. The, this, these, uh, these sort of feedback or sensing approaches might occur 
based on the maternal contribution to the egg or on uh, the influence of environmental factors. Um, and then there are, of course, very, very slow processes, generation. This is evolution. Sorry, I have to include evolution because the process of evolution is ultimately what controls uh, the design, the initial design of these programs. So we started with a set of really puzzling observations from the early embryo. And one of these was that um, certainly that embryos elongate at a constant rate, even though their stiffness is increasing. Uh, embryos with moderately reduced stiffness, and these are sort of across the board. Any treatment that we make that moderately reduces the stiffness of an embryo uh, leaves its development unperturbed. But any treatment that we, that we apply that's, that increases the stiffness of that embryo, sort of you know 50% or uh, doubles the stiffness, we see those embryos develop very uh, defectively. So uh, softening seems to be OK. Stiffening seems to put those embryos at risk of, uh, of uh, lethal, lethal phenotypes. OK, so to understand this, uh, these, these, these puzzling observations, we sort of return to this equation. So one side, uh, deformation, we know that when deformation goes wrong, we have these defects. Uh, we know the mechanical resistance is being decreased. So if you decrease mechanical resistance, uh, then in order to get the same rates of deformation, maybe you're, you're, the embryo is accommodating by decreasing the force production. Yes? Um, that's a that's a very good question. So so you're you're jumping ahead of me just a second. In my next button press, I was going to circle this uh, this aspect force. So I've only now just told you about measuring mechanical resistance, and the question is whether uh, we can know what the forces that are being generated by these tissues. So good good a very good question, and it, it's the next part of the talk. Okay, so we needed to measure force in order to get to these, uh, these questions. And so we started with an approach that was developed in Ray's lab by Steve Moore to measure the force of the elongation of a single explant. Uh, the problem with this approach is that uh, these embryonic tissue explants are kind of like uh, really soft bars of soap. Uh, if you try to grab them in any way, you try to compress them, they slip out of your hands, uh, or in this case, the grips of the, of the apparatus very, very quickly. So uh, rates of error and, uh, and, and drift in these particular experiments are very, very high. Although we can make individual measurements, we can't do so in a systematic way with high enough throughput that we can do real tests. So uh, what my student, Jian Zhou, did was to develop an approach using force reporting gels. So you've probably heard a lot about polyacrylamide gels that are used to measure uh, the force, traction forces of individual cells. Uh, we took sort of a slightly different approach and a very different scale. Uh, we cut out our particular tissues and put them, embedded them within an elastic gel. And uh, gel then uh, solidified that gel around those tissue explants. And as they elongate, uh, they push on the walls of this gel their cage, basically. And we can visualize the deformation and strain uh, within these elastic gels. And so taking that information, uh, we, we uh, confocal both the explant and the, and, the, and the gel itself with a bunch of fluorescent beads embedded in the gel. We can calculate displacement maps in that gel and extract out the stress profile. Uh, that's produced by an individual explant within a gel. Now we can do this very nicely in a relatively uh, high throughput way so that we can embed you know, like 20 explants in a gel. As long as they're separated from one another, we can put them on a stage of a multi-position controlled uh, confocal mic microscope and make a lot of great measurements simultaneously. And so I'll just, I'll just sort of take a look at these uh, sort of control experiments, but you have to validate methods for measuring gel deformation. Uh, you have to test the accuracy of this method. So we used a, a, a standard Hertzian contact methods to validate this. Uh, 
Uh, all of this stuff, of course, goes in the appendix of individual papers because it's not really part of the uh, part of the paper. It's just part of the certification process, you might think. Uh, and then we took tissues that don't actually extend and uh, saw just that they didn't actually generate any stress. Uh, so then we started to map out the 3D uh, profiles of stress production. We can't visualize, we can't look through the entire tissue explant because it's opaque. Uh, lasers don't go through opaque tissues, uh, frog tissues very well at all. Uh, but we can uh, sort of fake these 3D maps, not really fake them, but just by reorienting uh, the tissue explant in the gel, we can look at the force profiles or the stress profiles surrounding the, these differently oriented explants. And so most of the stress is produced in the, along the anterior posterior axis of the explants, a little bit in the dorsal ventral as these tissues try to thicken along with extend. So to get to this question of elongation, uh, we wanted to know whether tissues could adjust their production of force uh, in response to different mechanical environments. We can't, con yes? Uh, given the uh, resistance on the gel, was the definition of the tissue be the same? No, that's right. So the gel is, el is elastic, right? So it cannot uh, extend it indefinitely. So uh, what happens is that the tissue extends to a point where it comes into a mechanical equilibrium with the, uh, with the gel. And so we see them extend and there's, a, there's sort of a plateau in the amount of stress that's stored in the gel. Uh, so yeah, the explants themselves don't continue to elongate. However, because the inside of this gel, this gel is non-adhesive. So eventually, uh, the tissue will try and extend and extend and extend, and ultimately it buckles. Um, it basically go, enters boiler buckling and uh, flips uh, within these gel cages. And you, if you follow them for many hours afterwards, uh, you see that they, they, they do flip. Uh, we can't use those measurements because at that point they've already uh, they've buckled, and you're not measuring the... Oh yeah, we see we see force that you know where the you know if like I bend like this, then you would see uh, stress at at the uh, at the point of buckling uh, as well. So yeah, you can get the measurements, but uh, they're not so easy to interpret. Okay, so uh, just like you would with uh, uh, traditional polyacrylamide gel approaches, uh, we put these tissue explants in increasingly stiff. Uh, gels and then measured their ability to generate force or stress. And what we found was that uh, with very low uh, uh, stiffness gels, uh, they produced uh, maybe uh, three to four uh, pascal of stress uh, at their maximum. But when we increased the stiffness of the gel, they started to produce more and more stress. Now, they don't compensate fully for the stiffness of their surrounding microenvironment. They cannot generate enough uh, force against a 500 pascal gel in order to keep their rates of deformation the same. So we're, what we think is that they're really plateauing here in their ability to generate stress. So this might be an indication of both their ability to compensate for uh, some amount of, uh, of increased stiffness in the early embryo, but uh, might account also for the defects that we see when we increase stiffness just too much. Okay, so we wanted to ask what tissue generates force. Uh, if we look at anatomically those tissues uh, within gels, we can see what tissues look like when they aren't in gels, and we can see what they look like when they're in these super, super stiff gels. And we've seen uh, notochord development that looks, uh, here's a case where you might actually see a tissue buckling within uh, an embedded uh, tissue. So this, this piece of tissue is now basically showing that it may be buckling. And so we thought first that the notochord was generating this stiffness, um, but again, through the process of microsurgical manipulations, we showed, in fact, the notochord has absolutely no contribution uh, to that increase in uh, stress production. So we know a lot about the mechanics of the early embryo at this point. Uh, we know actomyosin is a contributor to both stiffness and, and force production and experiments I didn't show you. Uh, variation uh, and, um, and the sort of basic description of mechanics. But um, if we want to know about more complex uh, problems, we're sort of, uh, we're sort of left uh, 
you know, we're, we're trying to understand the, the, how feedback works uh, and at what level, but with these complex systems of embryonic development where you have multiple cell types, uh, multiple tissues, uh, it becomes very difficult to answer these. So um, we stepped back for a little bit to look at the, to sort of list the challenges of measuring the mechanical movement, the me physical mechanics of endogenous movement. So uh, in one regard, we can't control the timing or triggering of morphogenetic events. Uh, no one I know in developmental biology has a clue about what really triggers uh, morphogenetic movements. They think that it's just the timing of gene expression. But in many cases, you have movements that uh, occur simultaneously across many cell types. Um, and it's, it's thought that there's some uh, local community effect of communication. Uh, as I described already, tissue architecture is constantly changing in the early embryo. This uh, dorsal axis elongation is one example where uh, we think that the tissue architecture does not change that much, and it makes it possible for us to look at this. But if you want to understand how the heart develops, for instance, very complicated changes in the anatomy go on uh, consistently with the force production. And then it's difficult to measure force production uh, using these varying complex morphologies and geometries. So one way that we could have gone is to, make, uh, is to start making very complex computer simulations of these complex uh, geometries and complex force profiles. But we decided to go the opposite direction. And I think uh, we wanted to follow the approach that uh, skeletal, model, skeletal muscle physiologists have taken. And, uh, and they, took, they were faced with many of the same problems in understanding muscle function uh, in the early uh, 20th century. Uh, and so they approached it to first be able to induce contraction ectopically from, say, uh, neuronal control. Uh, they built devices to maintain and hold uh, constant muscle architecture and measure force production. And so uh, we turn to a different uh, at part of the embryo at a different stage to start to measure this. We turn to the, the embryonic epithelium. So the epithelium is mechanically accessible. It has all the same advantages as the rest of the embryo, large cells and a fate map. Uh, but we can, uh, we can, we can access this, uh, this tissue at any stage and we, can visual, and we can visualize the actomyosin dynamics within that tissue. And so what we decided to do was build uh, an aspiration-based approach. Instead of micro-aspiration, where you can measure the mechanical properties of sort of parts of a single cell, uh, we built a gigantic aspirator, one that is 150 microns in diameter, 125 microns in diameter, bring it up to the wall of the embryo and suck a small patch of tissue into the embryo. And furthermore, what we discovered was that uh, we could apply an electrical pulse uh, to stimulate contractility uh, in that epithelial, uh, epithelial sheet. So if you take a line and draw it along, along this, uh, this view of this tissue that's uh, being sucked into this microchannel and project it over time, you create this chymograph. So here's the embryo at rest. Uh, we decrease the pressure inside the microchannel. It draws part of that tissue in. We stimulate with an electrical stimulation. We can see uh, an autonomously produced contraction in that array of cells. And then uh, spontaneously it, it stops contracting and then the embryo continues to move in. And then we can decrease the pressure in the, in the microchannel and see relaxation of that, of that tissue at the end. So uh, we can calculate from this, we can calculate the um, viscoelastic material properties and the force generation capacities of this, this piece of tissue. And we've since gone on to show that the force generation capacities of these tissues are uh, analogous in both the timing and the, uh, the performance as the actomyosin contractility of individual cells. So it has the same sort of time constants, involves the same, many of the same proteins that activate. We can block this with uh, myosin, and, uh, myosin function in, inhibitors. So now I think we have some approach where we can cor control the precise timing, uh, we can control the architecture, and, uh, and we can make uh, force production measurements in, within this easily defined architecture. So instead of turning uh, complex morphology and geometry into a simulation, we turn the embryo into a very simple uh, model of a material property that's electrically stimulatable uh, and, and produces morphogenetic force.
So we first wanted to see whether uh, all of this was linear. Uh, I won't cover that. Uh, but one of the questions that, um, that has arised in development is whether tissues are mechanically sensitive. So if you poke an embryo or you somehow drive mechanical resistance, you know, put an embryo in a more uh, resistant environment, will it increase or change its own stiffness? And so uh, what my postdoc did was to, uh, to test a number of different, uh, a large number of embryos with uh, this electrical stimulation to see if a application of force resulted in a change in the stiffness properties of those tissues afterwards. Uh, to do so, he, he developed some, uh, he applied some uh, uh, very simple power law models of viscoelasticity and calculated uh, this, uh, uh, this beta constant. And this beta constant in, in our tissues, about 0.3, is almost exactly what you see in actin gels uh, and in even single cells. So he also wanted to know whether uh, the, the rate of strain would also change the mechanical property. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of groups that are postulating that uh, embryonic development depends on and can sense the rate of strain and can accommodate mechanical strains in some novel way. And so he applied uh, different ramps of uh, stimulation, mechanical stimulation, and could then measure uh, and fit with his relatively simple mechanical model uh, the responses of these tissues to these uh, different changes, uh, these changes in ramp, and found that the, uh, the, the, the power law model representations, the, the beta does not change at all over the time course of these. So these tissues are, they're not undergoing uh, fluidization with high strain rates, and they're not stiffening or changing their mechanical properties uh, over time with uh, the application of strain. However, some of the interesting things that he did find was that stiffer tissues in the embryo, ones that are at the high end of stiffness, produce stronger contractions uh, than, ex than tissues that, that are actually soft. So he found a very strong correlation uh, between stiff uh, and strong contractions. So this could be an indicator of one of these mechanically sensitive programs of, of development. Okay, so, uh, so in some sense, we've somewhat rewritten this equation of deformation, force, and resistance into a more, uh, 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 a more classical closed form integral equation that relates strain to uh, compliance and the change in stress. And we're working with this very simple linear model, closed form linear model of, uh, which we think of as almost like a model of morphogenesis uh, to explain um, morphogenetic events in the embryo. Okay, so uh, I think we're beginning to undercover uh, the molecular basis of these processes. And, uh, and I just wanted to finish up with just a couple of slides on some work that was carried out by a very uh, talented grad student who was collaborating with our group. Actually, he's sitting right over there, uh, Tony Kim. Uh, he's now doing a postdoc in the Langer lab. But uh, he was working with uh, Phil LeDuke, who's at uh, Carnegie Mellon University, which is uh, probably a, a stone's throw away from where we are, University of Pittsburgh. And, uh, and, and Phil and I had been uh, talking about collaborations. And uh, Tony personified those, those uh, theoretical talks between PIs and actually got some really interesting work done. So Tony started to uh, develop microfluidic arrays uh, devices that could apply very precisely uh, streams of uh, chemical components to the surface of tissue explants uh, over and look at how uh, those tissues respond uh, to those explant, those stimuli. So to, to really get an idea of what happens when you stimulate a tissue uh, and what happens in the response of that tissue. Um, we've done a number of different work, a uh, number of different things. Some of them are already published. Some of them are in, uh, in uh, review right now. And so with this approach, we can probe multicellular dynamics with direct chemical stimulation, uh, both long-term and high-speed control of timing. Uh, Tony built uh, devices such as this uh, to control those long-term streams, and we could, uh, we could precisely stimulate even uh, a, a, a stripe of cells 
that's say one diameter cell diameter across tissue. So I think this opens up for us a range of opportunities to control gene expression because you can control uh, if you can control the microenvironment, you can control the spatial organization of gene expression within tissues. You can control the signaling within tissues with uh, inhibitors and activators of uh, signaling systems. And I think this is great potential for exploring in a 2D system uh, the responses of these tissues uh, to these strains, to these, uh, these factors. So to summarize, I think we've gone through the, the roles for mechanics in early development, and I've shown you some ways that we have of measuring those mechanical properties, measuring viscoelasticity with this sort of stress relaxation test or microaspiration. We can measure force in these tissues. Traditionally with polyacrylamide gels, we've done that with tissue explants. We can also measure force production, bulk force production with these, uh, with these gels. Um, but I think there's a whole range of uh, major questions that remain. Uh, one of these are, um, you know, some of these are what are the potential mechanical stimuli within tissues? We have a lot of, you know, a lot of hypothesis out there about the role of mechanics in morphogenesis. Very few of those hypotheses have been directly tested. I think it's really critical to develop experimental techniques to go in and probe and actually test the role of mechanical stimuli during development. Uh, so we need to know whether cells really sense these stimuli. Uh, do they really sense them? And can we visualize their changes on a, on a time scale that is, uh, that is useful for us? So if you have to rely on tissues to undergo uh, changes in cell identity uh, to, to assess their response to a mechanical stimulation, I think that's too long. You need to see what happens immediately. What signaling pathways are being stimulated? What events within the cytoskeleton are being changed uh, within minutes, not uh, hours or days? Um, with that kind of information, I think we'll really be able to make some headway on understanding the molecular mechanisms, uh, what the responses of the cells are, and then lastly, whether we can control the stimuli with the expectation of a particular response. We want to be able to uh, routinely know what, how we're stimulating a cell and predict what the response of those cells are to that stimulation. In order to build these sort of engineering modules, you need to know these things. You can't just say there's a big black box. I think we need to know um, how those cells are responding if we want to be able to control them within a complex multicellular environment. And with that, um, I'll, uh, I'd like to thank, uh, first of all, Ray Keller and my postdoc mentors a number of years ago for uh, bringing me a, a biophysicist uh, into their lab uh, with no wet lab experience whatsoever. I had no idea how to operate a pipetter, a pipetman. I didn't know what the yellow tip was versus a blue tip. Um, so with, uh, and then also to thank uh, the members of the lab who worked on uh, a, a lot of this, uh, did a lot of this work, uh, Mickey Van Dassau, who came to me as an integrative biologist uh, who was interested in ecology, development, and evolution. Um, three of those things, two of those things he worked on in my lab, so uh, ecology and development, and now he's back at uh, uh, near an ocean uh, at the Duke Marine Station doing more, uh, more of that. Um, one of the students that worked on the actin dynamics was Hei Young Kim. She's a postdoc at Princeton. Uh, Tony is here at MIT. Uh, Jen Zhou is working at UC Irvine as a postdoc in Stephen George's lab on uh, tissue engineering of uh, cardiac uh, replacement tissues. And I thank uh, all the uh, collaborators that we've had, specifically Phil LeDuc and Bill Messner, uh, who've been instrumental in uh, helping us formulate these uh, sort of control theory uh, ideas of how embryonic tissues are stimulated and respond to those uh, stimuli. So thank you very much. Stunned. We have time for some questions. Oh, good, good.
So I have a question. Um, just like you were showing the migration of the lateral line south right. of the rockfish uh, across like a well-defined path. So is there any contribution from the ECM that guides the south, and what are the factors um, that actually coordinate the movement? So uh, I, I would have to... Uh, I would have to uh, say that I, I, I think there are very few what are, co what are soluble factors. So keep on talking about solu soluble factors. As engineers, we love soluble factors because we can control them. I think in embryos, nothing is soluble, right? The activity of proteins are, are, are always felt very close to where they're synthesized. So um, in that particular case, there's a protein SDF1 alpha, which is a chemokine that is secreted and assembled into an extracellular matrix that actually runs al along the entire length of the zebrafish embryo uh, before those cells even arrive. So the embryo has already made, in that case, a roadway for those cells. They have uh, CXCR4, CXCR7 receptors for SDF1, and they are primed to basically sense that, uh, that roadway, process, gobble up, actually, the SDF1 alpha that then drives the polarity of cells within that slug. So they don't, so because they, they have this stripe of, uh, of signal to track on, uh, they could just, you know, they could just walk in one direction in this stripe and then sort of get distracted for a minute, turn around, and walk back on the same stripe if they didn't have some uh, persistence in polarity. And the, the sort of the construction of that slug allows them to uh, develop a polarity within it that gives them the ability to, um, to use the permissive signal of the SDF1 in an instructive fashion. So, um, yeah. But, um, what actually prevents the cells like, from, from going back? Because we see that um, at the final state, actually, we have a full track of cells that was in the um, what keeps them from going back? So the, the receptor CXCR4 is expressed at the leading edge of those, that slug, and uh, the receptor CXCR7 is expressed at the, the, post, the, the back half of the bus, basically. So CXCR7 basic, only works to sort of uh, uh, sponge up the SDF1 alpha and doesn't signal. SDF1 alpha does signal through CXCR4. So you have a polarity built within this slug where at the rear of the, of the, of the slug, cells don't sense it. All, right? All they do is they follow along with the cells that are moving. The cells in the front are the ones that sense it and they're the only ones. So the polarity, the sort of, what I was talk, talking about the feedback loops, in that case are operating within a few hundred cells uh, within that slug that give them the polarity to, uh, to migrate in what we would consider uh, like a road, uh, you know, an open road. But if you think about it like, you know, driving out on the street, I don't know, here Boston might be a special uh, exception, but in Pittsburgh, people drive on the right-hand side of the street and, uh, you know, and they all go in the same direction. Um, you know, so they follow, you know, the roads aren't meant for cars to be going in both directions uh, opposed to one another simultaneously. Uh, there are cues for drivers uh, that polarize their movements. Uh, cars generally don't go equally well in the back direction as the front, even though they can. Uh, so I think if you take, you, you know, you have to, have to start thinking about how um, these uh, modules are designed, uh, you can start to see you know, how they actually control directed migration versus just, you know, why is it that those cells just don't spread out on the stripe and you get a constantly, you know, dense array of cells along that SDF1 alpha stripe? But yeah, I mean, those are key questions. Those are, those principles of uh, directed cell migration are just now being worked out. I mean, there's, you know, exciting work going on now uh, that's figuring out those principles. So I think we're, at the right time as tissue engineers to start you know, reading that literature very, very closely, trying to pull out uh, key features and say, well, okay, if we're gonna build a tissue, we have to know how to, how to connect a small cluster of cells over here to another cluster of cells over here. And we have to do this in a dense tissue. 
right? So if you want to make that, you want to make those connections, those wiring connections, you have to be able to, to drive, that, uh, drive that event. And how would you go about doing that? Uh, substrate patterning, microfluidics, optogenetic controls, all of those, all of those processes are available to us, you know, but they're not necessarily operating in the embryo. Yep. Um, I was going to show a uh, video about uh, like a, um, so you cut and paste uh, tissue and observe this you know, similar conversion extension. Um, but I noticed that it seems, it seems to me the elongation there is more significant. Okay, so uh, one of the reasons why elongation is so different when you take them out and put them on a, on a, in, a in a dish is that we typically um, these cells are expecting to see a fibronectin substrate, uh, and when we take them out of the embryo, we give them a fibronectin substrate, but it's attached to glass. Uh, in that, that's now a novel mechanical microenvironment for these cells where normally they would extend uh, attached to the substrate or uh, attached to their neighbors and contract. Um, now they're attaching to their neighbors, but their neighbors are glued to glass. The substrate that they're on is glued to glass. When they try to contract, they can't. They can't overcome the mechanical resistance of the glass, and they get very, very long. So the aspect ratios of cells as they, uh, as they intercalate on glass can be like six to one, whereas if you look in the embryo, they're never much more than about two or three to one. Uh, so that's the, that's the issue, is that the material properties of the embryo are viscoelastic. Uh, they're not elastic, right? So that, you know, as a cell grabs its substrate and pulls, there's viscous dissipation as that cell contracts. So you're not storing elastic energy in their substrates, which are other cells. So I think one, one thing that came out of this talk was some exciting work by Dave Mooney, who's building uh, viscoelastic substrates for cell migration. Uh, very exciting to me, because I think viscoelastic substrates are much more like what uh, embryonic tissues are, not elastic. Yeah. Yeah. So for the uh, elongation of the tissue, we should so those tissues are elongating um, it, because of individual cell rearrangement within those tissues. So the process of convergent extension is operating within those tissues. So individual cells are trying to intercalate between one another, and they're pushing the tissue to elongate. And because it's trapped within a gel, um, it uh, it can generate, it can generate, it generates force in the embryo, but trapped within the gel, um, it pushes against the elastic uh, cage of the gel. And so that's really what we're, what we're measuring. We're not measuring the actual force in the tissue, we're measuring the reaction force uh, that's, that's, needed to con that's needed to constrain that tissue within that cage. And so our gels, of course, are elastic, and we don't, we, they don't viscoelastically deform, or they're, uh, they're a little bit viscoelastic, but on this scale, they're elastic. So I realize, uh, so this is the, the, after the surgery, so it's, it's, a, it's a separate tissue. Right. right. In the in vivo system, they actually have to also migrate relative to the other, other tissue. Because so, uh, yeah, so this tissue isn't doing much migration. Most of the rearrangements are local. Um, the, there's, it's not really understood how much shear. So you're sort of asking about tissue shear. Uh, there's a little bit of tissue shear in, within this tissue, but not a whole lot. There are other, other uh, events during gastrulation and later during morphogenesis when tissues actively do slide over one another great distances, but in this particular case, not so much. Do you have actually two-headed frogs in your lab? I mean, you do microsurgery and put them together. <laughs> so do you happen to actually develop into a full-grown frog with two heads? Yes, you can make frogs with two heads quite easily. Um, uh, 
the uh, the cloud the exper there was a experiment done um, by uh, 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 in the early 1900s where you where um, uh, Hilda Mangold working in Hans Spemann's lab grafted a piece of tissue from the prospective head region of the embryo into another embryo in the prospective uh, sort of uh, uh, I'd say posterior region. And uh, what those embryos develop are two heads on the same embryo. Uh, and the, the, really the remarkable thing is that those, uh, those heads are connected. Uh, the, 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 the two heads are at one end, and they share one tail. Uh, so they join in mid-body. So they have two notochords, uh, two eyes, two heads. I don't know. They never, you know, they. I, I, I don't think, you know, they don't do well when they uh, when they reach uh, uh, more advanced stages. But you see, you know, you check on the internet. You know, twin. You know, conjoined twins, and you can find all sorts of animals have uh, conjoined twins. The remarkable thing is, if you look at all of those animals, all of those examples from the internet, uh, and you'll see that they always have two. Uh, that's always duplications of the anterior. It's never duplications of the posterior. So they may have uh, two heads, uh, four arms, but they'll have uh, two legs, or they'll have they'll have the regular array of uh, of legs. So the process of gastrulation starts first anteriorly, and then goes posteriorly. In the frog embryo, the mouse embryo, the chick embryo, they all work the same way. Uh, and if you put two organizers in that will, that will induce two heads, um, those uh, processes will, will join together uh, to, but share a common tail. Um, so how the mechanics of that works, how the signaling accommodates that to produce something that even looks recognizable, I think is very remarkable and tells us a lot about the robustness um, I have a couple of movies I could show you later, but um, you know that working in a lab, of a developmental biology lab, um, everyone appreciates kind of uh, freaks of nature. So you know, if you see something weird happening in your dish, uh, you call over everybody in the lab. It's like, ooh, look at that! And there's two heads forming, or there's an embryo with two blastopores. Uh, you know, you, know mm -hmm. you just set it up and make a time lapse movie and take a look at it. But I think there's some uh, there's some remarkable uh, aspects of robustness that are uh, we can also see where there are apparent defects in early development, but the embryos accommodate those and develop into perfectly normal tadpoles. So uh, on one hand, it's really important to for ge for genetic analysis of the signaling and gene regulatory networks that development is fragile, because you have to be able to break you know pull proteins out and see what kind of phenotypes they make. But there's other aspects in which you can perturb, uh, you can pull some proteins out and you see no defects whatsoever. Um, geneticists and developmental biologists have terms for that. Uh, they call it redundancy. Uh, whenever you hear the word redundancy or penetrance or something like that, it means they don't have a clue about what's going on, okay? Uh, I hope that's not recorded, but all right. <laughs> Yes. You should very simplified model. Uh, so, what if if you consider the, the shape or geometry, and what, is it a completely different uh, output, or uh, if you consider biaxial force instead of the, the axial? Uh, so you're, you're asking if we change the geometry of the compression tests. Mm -hmm. um, so we do the or stress. If yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think I understand. So one of the reasons why we chose that specific test and the specific tissue is that when for a, a, a stress relaxation test, a uniaxial compression test. You rely on the material to have the same cross section and the same composition along the length of that that beam or column. I mean, if you talk about you know applying this to an I beam, for instance, you would only apply it to the ends of the I beam. It wouldn't make any sense to apply it to the sides of an I beam, right? So the same is true in the embryo. Um, these tissues are complex, 
uh, in their sort of laminar structure and their cross section, but that cross sectional structure is very similar from the posterior end of the embryo up to the anterior end, at least in the pieces that we're taking. So we're reasonably confident that we can interpret the experiment. So if you do the other experiment where you compress it in the other direction, where very complex morphology, very complex anatomy, I don't know how to interpret the results, right? Um, it's, like, it's like taking an I-beam and compressing it in the, you know, across the, the, the structure. Um, it's not easy to interpret the results. You would need complicated finite element models that would inherently require the information that you're getting from the uni you know, from the axial compression test. So it would be really just a validation uh, with these other geometries. So um, that's why we turn to the microaspirator, which is a more um, isotropic measure of mechanical properties. And we can do this at a time in the embryo's development where there's relatively uh, little anatomy that we have to account for. So we could perturb the molecular composition of those tissues and not have to rely on the embryo to build this axis for us to test in the uniaxial compression device. Uh, so that's, that's actually a great u utility of microaspiration. We don't require a geometry, a correct geometry uh, to start with. Yeah. Did I answer your question? Thanks. Yes. So I was wondering for the relaxation test that you mentioned, you know, if you consider the linear model you showed, if you, uh, if you try using simple, nonlinear, empirical functions. Yeah, we could use any kind of con any kind of constitutive model uh, for viscoelasticity and get pretty reasonable fits. Uh, the so we chose the standard linear solid model because um, it's relatively easy to look at the graph and extract out your uh, your K1, your K2, your residual stiffness versus your instantaneous stiffness and the viscous response. It's just really, it's easy. I, don't, I, I mean, I, we could get into a complicated hours long discussion about which constitutive material pro, uh, model to use. But I think in, in this particular case, we didn't rely on the model to do our experimental tests. We looked at the stiffness at 180 seconds for all of our comparisons. I don't like to calculate something uh, and then compare it experimentally. I like to have something that we observe and, and com do those comparisons just to take a little bit more out of, the, uh, out of the mix of variability and interpretation. So that did change a little bit when we switched to using uh, the microaspirator uh, to measure stiffness. And there we did test a number of different models uh, constitutive models and structural models. Uh, we looked at surface tension as a possible